Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Three Crowns, the show where we believe the Father is King, so we crown him, that the Son is King, so we crown him, and that the Holy Spirit is King, so we crown him. That's one, two, three crowns. This is your favorite Trinitarian apologetic show. I'm your host, Dane Von Ace. This is brought to you by Faith Unaltered, just a wonderful YouTube channel that you should subscribe to if you have not done so already. We love you. We uh, we thank you for your support of our ministries. If you like what we're doing, like our videos, share our videos, and definitely subscribe to the channel. Good to see GU is here first, and he's reminding us of that biblical truth, the first shall be last. So I guess that means um, you'll have to stick around to the very end of this video and make sure you're the last to comment as well as being the first to comment. Um, yeah, I hope everybody's having a great Tuesday. I've definitely been having a good start to the week. Uh, I have had my thoughts and my mind on Marmari, the bishop of the Assyrian Church of the East, and he suffered an attack while he was preaching. He was preaching and a guy came in and it was a it was a terrorist and he comes in with a knife and starts trying to stab Bishop Marmari. And to my knowledge, there was actually kind of a miracle that took place where the terrorist knife actually did not deploy correctly. I guess, um, you know, it's like a switchblade. It didn't, it didn't operate correctly. And Marmari was not super harmed. And there's just this really vivid image where the attacker has his knife and the bishop is holding the cross of Christ. And the bishop is then, of course, um, uh, bullied down to the floor. And when the, when, when he woke up from the hospital, you know, the very first thing he did was pray for God's mercy upon his attacker. So very Christ-like. Jesus hanging on the cross says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Marmari, when he's conscious, he wants to pray for the attacker. So keep him and his congregation in, in your prayers. Keep the perpetrator of this terrorist attack in your prayers. He was young. He's like 15-year-old boy. Uh, been radicalized by um, uh, Islamic doctrine, it, it, it appears. And so uh, pray for everybody involved. But that's been on my mind and on my heart. And something else that's kind of been on my mind with all this is the Church of Jesus Christ, she will be persecuted. She will be hated by the world. Because her Lord was crucified. The world hated him first. And so as we imitate him, as we walk in his ways, as we obey his commandments, it does draw persecution from the world. And for those of us who live in the United States, it's a reminder that we should be thankful that we don't suffer the same level of intense persecution as many of our brothers and sisters around the world. Those who are imprisoned for the faith in North Korea or who are imprisoned for preaching the gospel in Somalia or Yemen or Iran, uh, the Armenian Christians who have faced genocide within the past hundred years and who are facing something very similar going on right now. The news isn't really covering it that much, but you can look into what's happening in Armenia as we speak. And of course, Marmari just assaulted uh, and violently attacked. We, we know that Christians are persecuted all around the world, and we ought to be very grateful as 
people in the United States that we don't face that level of persecution. And it actually should actually shame us when we are timid to share the gospel because like, oh, what what might people think? They might think we're, that we're weird or they might think that we're behind the times or they might think that we're some backwoods fundamentalist. They may think that we're just a Bible thumper and, you know, they're going to th see us as a, the weird Flanders on the Simpsons and make fun of us for being dorky or whatever. And like we struggle just to overcome the fear of being called dorky or being called, uh, you know, a, a cultural dinosaur, being called uh, too behind the times or something. We get we get afraid of being called a bigot or something. And like our brothers and sisters in the Middle East or in certain parts of Asia or certain parts of Africa or Marmari is even in Australia. Like he's not even in uh, somewhere you would expect horrible persecution to take place like that. But we should be seeing them so courageous for the faith, so fearless for Christ, so willing to put their life on the line for him. We should be encouraged by that, inspired by that, and it should embolden us that we can certainly uh, withstand just being made fun of by by people. And um, we need to go out there with the gospel, y'all. Uh, we need to be fearlessly going out with that message that Paul and the apostles gave us as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. We need to be going out and telling people he will return and he will judge the living and the dead and that he will return to separate the sheep from the goats and that we can all be sheep if we put our faith in Christ, if we put our faith in his name, if we are covered in his blood, if we repent of our sins. And we really need to be very uh, strong in our zeal for sharing that message with the world. So just wanted to say some of that to begin with. And uh, tonight's show is going to be kind of a mixed bag, uh, and I would be really glad to take audience questions. If you want to uh, give give us in, any questions in the comments, go for it. And if you super chat it, that will take first priority, and we would be uh, especially grateful to the super chats for supporting our ministry. But yeah, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag tonight. We're just going to be looking at various Trinitarian proofs from the scriptures, and I kind of wanted to pick some that were a little bit maybe more under the radar. Those of you who are really into Trinitarian apologetics, I'm sure you've watched lots of debates and, you know, those debates, I, I, I say there's the big three, right? You've got John 1, the, that's the big one. That's a home run hit for Trinitarianism. You've got Hebrews 1 and uh, you've got Philippians 2. Those are just a home run hits. Uh, there's other passages as well, but those seem to be the big three that just get hammered over and over and over again. And they're glorious passages. They they fully display the deity of Christ, no doubt about that. So those are good ones to be the big three. But I kind of wanted to look at some other passages tonight that maybe sort of fly under the radar a little bit. And one of those that I want to start with is actually 1 Corinthians 10. Now, in a way, this doesn't fly under the radar, especially verses uh, 4 and verses uh, 9. But I want to look through the entire start of the chapter, the, the first 22 verses, and I want to show you that this is absolutely teaching the divinity of Jesus Christ and his preexistence and his role in saving Israel from Egypt and, and helping them when they're wandering through the desert. And I want to show you that essentially this is undeniable, and that'll equip you when, uh, when you're dealing with Unitarians out there. And if you're a Unitarian watching this, especially if you're watching it live, come up with some comments try to push back. Uh, I will be glad to, to rebut any, anything that you're saying in the, in the comment section. So first Corinthians 10 is where we're going to start. And it certainly teaches the divinity of Christ. Good to see my brother from another mother and my co-host here on faith and altar, Josh Davidson. What's up, dude. Good to see you. Uh, this Friday, Josh is going to have an awesome show on the Cosmic Corner. I'm going to be joining him on it, and we're going to talk about how the hero is self-sacrificial. The hero is self-sacrificial and how Jesus reforms, reshapes, and uh, re-images how we understand the hero. Also good to see my dear friend Elaine here. Glad to have you here. Always a pleasure to have you in the comment section and watching and supporting Love all of you. 
So uh, here we go. Josh is putting it more clearly. How self-sacrifice changed the hero archetype forever. So that'll be 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central this Friday. I'll be joining Josh on the Cosmic Corner. And those of you who aren't familiar with Josh in the Cosmic Corner, that's one of our uh, segments on Faith Unaltered. And man, it's good stuff. Josh is a deep thinker. Um, you know, I I can pound the the key on the piano of, of the Trinity and I can just pound that key over and over and over. What Josh does is he plays these beautiful sonatas and he weaves everything together. Um, the guy is, uh, he probably wouldn't uh, say this about himself because he's humble, but the guy's a genius. I think he's a genius. He's either a genius or he's really good at listening to geniuses and absorbing what they say and regurgitating it. So uh, yeah, I am nice. You're the genius and I'm the nice guy. How about that? That sounds good to me. So uh, all right, we're going to jump in. First Corinthians 10. This is an absolute uh, knockout home run for Trinitarianism. And we're going to read verses 1 through 22. And we'll pause along the way. And then if, for those of you who kind of like to know where this is headed, we're also going to look at Deuteronomy 32 uh, and how it correlates with 1 Corinthians 10. So here we go. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Um, this is the word of God. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. So first and foremost, he's hearkening back to when the presence of God was fully manifested in a cloud and they uh, were able to escape from Egypt through the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Spirit and water, baby. Look at that. In the cloud and in the sea prefigures baptism. Baptism is by the spirit and water, John 3, 5. And side note, this is purely a side note, but don't you believe that babies were in the arms of their mothers and fathers as they crossed through the Red Sea and were baptized into Moses? Hmm, I think so. Don't you think that now in the church, mothers and fathers should carry their babies to the baptismal font and we should be dunking or sprinkling those sweet children? Yes, you should. Infant baptism for the win, all day, every day. Baptize your babies. If you're married and have children in the church, baptize your babies. All right, so here we go. Uh, then we get to verse three. They all ate the same spiritual food. That's speaking of the manna that God gave them miraculously from heaven. And then it says this, and they drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Now, right there, we already see Christ in action in the Exodus with the people of Israel in the wilderness. Because here's the thing. This cannot be Paul referring to simply the promise of the Messiah, because promises don't accompany you and you don't drink from them actively. When you drink from something actively, you're aware of it. You are, you are receiving spiritual nourishment from it. And for it to accompany them, that's relational language. That is interpersonal language. You could have a, a deep conviction that a promise has been given and that a the one who gave it is sure to fulfill it. Yes and amen. Abraham believed in the promise of the Messiah. But you wouldn't talk about that as it's accompanying me, right? And so the Unitarian would, would basically only have that as the option. The promise of Christ accompanied them. They were drinking from the spiritual rock uh, of Christ, and that was the promise of his, his coming. I think that's a really flimsy argument. And it'll get even flimsier as we go on. But just think about how flimsy that is. I can simply read verse 4 here and say, okay, so Christ was with them in the wilderness. He accompanied them. That's the natural way of reading that word accompany, right? In fact, let's let's go to the lexicon. I didn't even do this before, so we'll see what happens here. But let's go to the lexicon and look at the word accompanied. So uh, to follow. So they are following, uh, being followed by Christ. Um, the usage is I accompany, I attend, or I follow, right? Um, akulutheo, akulutheo. And so this is relational language. Let's see other ways that, um, it's used in the New Testament. So it's used as they followed Christ, right? Um, look at this right here. 
in Matthew 4.20, when Christ is calling his disciples, they left their nets. The fishermen, James, John, Peter, they left their nets and they followed Christ. It's the same word. This is relational language, right? This is language of actually uh, one person following another person. This is language of of, a, of of someone actually being with someone as they follow them. So Christ is following them in the wilderness. All right. So then we get to uh, to verse five. But one other thing to highlight here in verse four, he's called the spiritual rock. Keep that in mind. The spiritual rock. Okay. The spiritual rock is following them. Now, like I said, keep that in mind. Then we get to verse five. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them for they were struck down in the wilderness. Okay. We know God wasn't pleased with them for so many reasons in the wilderness. Uh, they make a golden calf and bow down to it. That's not pleasing to God. That's idolatry. They are scoping out the land that God has promised them and they get scared because the people who dwell in the land look, look like fierce warriors and giants and they're timid and they get scared and cowardly and God's not happy about that. The only two that are brave are Caleb and Joshua. God blesses them for their bravery. He's also not happy with them how they're constantly grumbling against Moses. Why did you bring us out here just to die? Our lives were better in Egypt. So God's not pleased with most of them and he's striking them down. And the generation that went out from Egypt is actually not the generation that goes into the promised land. It's their children because God was not pleased with them. Verse six, these things took place as examples to keep us from craving evil things as they did. So Paul's telling us this is an example for all believers. Look, see the failures of the Israelites in the wilderness. See their failures of grumbling against God's prophet. See their failures of idolatry. See their failures of cowardice and learn from them. Don't fall into the same pitfalls. Don't make the same mistakes as them. It says, do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. Now, this part gets really interesting right here. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. So Paul has already told us that Christ accompanied them in the wilderness and that he was the spiritual rock from which they drank. And now he's telling us that they put Christ to the test. They actually tested Christ in the wilderness. And the result of their testing Christ is that God sent the venomous snakes into their camp to afflict them and to bite them and to chastise them. And then, of course, Moses cries out to God, intercedes for the people. And the solution is the bronze serpent on the pole. They look at it, they're healed. But the text that Paul has written here says it's Christ they put to the test. So if the Unitarian wanted to try a flimsy argument that the spiritual rock and Christ that accompanied them was this idea of the promise, right? They've, they've got the promise in their mind that's accompanying them in the wilderness. And they're just so committed to this promise um, that that's what's accompanying them. That interpretation now fails when we see, nope, they tested Christ. They had this actual personal relationship with Christ where they actually tested him. You can't you can't put a promise to the test, right? Like in that sense. You can't do that. It doesn't work if you're following Paul's train of thought. Now, the Unitarian will try to wiggle out of this one by appealing to this footnote right here. You see how there's a footnote right here? I'll zoom in on it. Appeal to that footnote. Well, if you investigate that footnote, you'll find out that this uh, has a textual variant. So not all the ancient manuscripts read the exact same way. Some of the manuscripts, uh, the, the majority, I believe, and the best reading say Christ. But some say, test the Lord. Okay, so the Unitarian will say, look, look, it's uh, poorly translated when it says they tested Christ. It should be test the Lord. Listen, don't let that throw you off as a Trinitarian, because when Paul writes about the Lord, almost every time, almost every single time, he's referring to Jesus Christ. When he speaks of God, it's usually speaking of the Father. And when he speaks of the Lord, it's usually speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, he could call Jesus God um, 
That's perfectly fine and appropriate. He does that in Romans 9, 5, and in uh, Titus. He calls Jesus God and Savior. But almost every time he's going to choose to use the word God for the Father and the word Lord for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can show you this really clearly in uh, just two chapters before 1 Corinthians 10. So if we go just two chapters before in 1 Corinthians 8, you have this passage in verse 6 that says, Yet for us there is but one God the Father, from whom are all things, uh, from whom all things came, and for whom we exist, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we exist. So he's he's saying there's one God who made all things, and there's one Lord through whom all things are made. Both of them are, are co-equal in the act of creating the universe. Both are eternal. Both are here before creation. But we call the Father God and we call Jesus Lord. That's just the vocabulary that Paul utilizes most often. And so when we get just two chapters later, and he's saying you put the Lord to the test in the wilderness, we know who he believes is the Lord. That's Jesus. So the textual variant is not an issue. Again, Christ is the best reading. That's why it's translated as Christ here. And the footnote says Lord. That's why it's translated as Christ. And I believe the vast majority of our English Bibles. But even if it was Lord, even if that textual variant was the better reading, that would still indicate we're talking about Jesus here. And just to show you how amazing this is, what Paul is saying, that we should not test Christ as some of them did when they were killed by snakes. Let's go back and look at that instance when they were killed by snakes in Numbers 21. So Numbers 21, we read this of the account. Oops. Where? Okay, here we go. Then they set out from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea in order to bypass the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient on the journey and spoke against God and against Moses. So there is the, the testing, right? They speak against God. They're testing God. And Paul interprets that as they are testing Christ. We have, why have you led us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water and we detest this wretched food. So the Lord sent venomous snakes. Who did it? Yahweh did it. They tested God, Elohim, Yahweh. And so Yahweh responds by sending venomous snakes among the people, and many of the Israelites were bitten and died. So it is clearly Yahweh who is tested and sends the venomous snakes. Also God, Elohim, another title for Yahweh. And then going back to 1 Corinthians 10, you see that Paul is interpreting Numbers 21 as being about Christ. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. All right, so, so far, y'all, we have seen Christ as the spiritual rock from which they drank, who accompanied them in the wilderness. And now we've seen that Christ is the one they tested in the wilderness. And the Old Testament says that was Yahweh they tested in the wilderness. And then Christ, Yahweh, send the venomous snakes. All right, so clearly Christ in the teaching of Paul is preexistent. It's very clear that Paul sees Christ at work in the Old Testament, and it's very clear that Paul sees Christ as Yahweh because he is the one that is tested and sends the snakes. And now it is, through Paul's inspired interpretation, Jesus in that role. All right, let's keep going because it actually gets even deeper. And do not complain as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Now these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So the one who thinks he is standing firm should be careful not to fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape so that you can stand under it. So this is just a beautiful pastoral note from Paul. He's saying, look, temptation's bound to come. But when it comes, don't stumble into it. God will provide an escape for you. If you struggle with temptations towards sin, if you struggle with a sin that has um, become very, very difficult for you to get out of your mind and, and you're so close to succumbing to it, know that God does have an escape hatch for you. Pray to him to, pro to provide you the insight and the wisdom to take that escape hatch 
You don't have to be the one grumbling against Moses and against God in the desert. You don't have to be the one bowing down to a golden calf. You don't have to be the one that falls over and over and over again because there is an escape to your temptation. We can actually grow in holiness. Yes, before we're born again, we're slaves to sin. But once we're born again, we are slaves to Christ and we he will provide for us ways out of our sin. We don't have to be despairing Christians of like, oh, I'm just going to be uh, stuck with sin, uh, just overpowering me until the day that I die and I go to heaven. No, we can have victory over sin. We should have victory over sin. And day by day, we should be growing in our sanctification. There is always an escape hatch for us provided by God himself. So when there's temptations that come upon you, pray to the Lord to help you through it. If you do end up succumbing to it, pray a prayer of repentance. So I just wanted to highlight that pastoral note from Paul. Now let's keep going. We're going to get into a really juicy part of this. So Paul continues, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to reasonable people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of blessing that we bless a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? So what he's saying is flee from idolatry and go to the table of the Lord. Flee from idolatry. Go participate in communion. Flee from idolatry. Go drink the blood of Christ and eat his flesh. And he says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices fellow partakers in the altar? Am I suggesting then? that food sacrificed to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. Remember that line. Remember that line. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. So what he's saying is, don't participate in pagan sacrifices, and don't eat the meat uh, of the of the sacrifices that are happening in, in pagan temples. Those are sacrificed to demons. Those are sacrificed to fallen angels that are leading people away from God. You need to be participating up here in what he's already said. You need to be participating in the body and the blood of Christ in Holy Communion, in the Eucharist. And so he keeps going and he says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. So look, (laughs) y'all, there's no gray area here. It's black or white. You're either with Christ or not with Christ. You don't get to drink the cup of Christ and the cup of demons. What? mixture does light have with darkness? What fellowship does good have with evil? You're either in Christ or you're you're not. You're either truly fellowshipping with him at the table of the Lord or you're not. And this is why you all need to really examine yourselves before you take communion. Is, is your faith in Christ strong? Are you fully committed to Christ as your Lord and Savior and you want no other as uh, as as your master? You want no other. You just want Christ. If that's your heart, then drink deeply from the cup of the Lord. But we can't be drinking from the cup of the Lord on Sunday and drinking from a cup of demons on Monday, you see, right? It says, uh, you cannot partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons too. Are we trying to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now really, again, cling to that line. Are we trying to provoke the Lord to jealousy? And cling to this line, the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons. And cling to the line uh, up here of the spiritual rock that is Christ. Those three things, really, really remember them, okay? Remember them. The spiritual rock, that pagan sacrifice to demons, and that uh, and that we don't want to provoke the Lord to jealousy. Remember those three things, okay? Remember them, remember them, remember them. You got them in your mind? <laughs> Josh, you're so goofy, man. Guess I better put my demon cup back in storage, LOL. Yeah, no, throw it on a fire and burn it. That's probably even better. <laughs> I love you, Josh. Oh, man. Um, Jamie uh, asking a question about that call to holiness that I just gave. Um, yeah, but if I stop sinning, will that be works-based? Nope. The, it will just be fulfilling the good works that God prepared for us beforehand, Ephesians 2.10. So, um. All right. Do you remember what I just said? The three things, the spiritual rock, the sacrifices of pagans are given to demons, and we don't want to provoke the Lord to jealousy. Okay. Remember those three things as we turn to Deuteronomy 32. And it's going to be extremely clear 
that when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 10, he had Deuteronomy 32 in mind. He is taking Deuteronomy 32 and, and he is crafting it into 1 Corinthians 10 in a stunningly beautiful way. And uh, let's look at this. So we'll start in verse 15 and we'll go to verse 22. Y'all, this is going to blow your mind if you haven't seen this before. Glory to God. Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked, becoming fat, bloated, and gorged. He abandoned the God who made him and scorned the rock of his salvation. So God is the rock of his salvation. And this rock is being abandoned, tested, you know. Now, rock of salvation is an interesting phrase, right? This is a rock that's with them in the wilderness. Because remember, Deuteronomy 32 is, is Moses' song about them being in the wilderness and saved by God and, and all of that. Rock of salvation. This is different from the rock that they drank from, which Moses, you know, struck with his staff and, and the water came forth, right? This is different. This is a spiritual rock, you might say. Ah, a rock of salvation. You might say, well, that's not a literal physical rock. That's a rock that's spiritual. It's God, right? The rock is God. And I can prove that this is a different rock than the rock that is, is literal, because look, right up here in verse 13, Moses has already talked about that rock. He made him ride on the heights of the land and fed him the produce of the field. He nourished him with honey from the rock and oil from the flinty crag or the flinty rock. So that's the rock that was feeding them. But there's a spiritual rock that is, you might say, accompanying them or following them. Ah, interesting. So already we've got this spiritual rock and it's God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 that the spiritual rock is Christ. But look on. If the parallel hasn't sunk in yet, it's about to big time. They provoked his jealousy with foreign gods. They enraged him with abominations. So look at that, y'all. They provoked to jealousy who? The rock of salvation, Yahweh God. They provoked the spiritual rock to jealousy with foreign gods. Now, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is telling us not to provoke Christ to jealousy and, and not to participate in both his table where his body and blood are and also the table of, of demons. He's saying, don't provoke Christ to jealousy. The same way Moses was saying, Israel provoked Yahweh to jealousy with foreign gods, with demons. Let's keep going. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they had not known. So those three things I told you to keep in mind, spiritual rock, provoking God to jealousy, and that pagan sacrifice not to God, but to demons. All three of those points are right here in Deuteronomy 32. And Paul is clearly alluding to them in 1 Corinthians 10. The difference between the language of Deuteronomy 32 and 1 Corinthians 10 is only this. Moses attributes all this to Yahweh. Paul attributes all this to Christ. Because Paul understands, Moses understood it too, I believe, that Yahweh is Christ. It goes on. This rock language is, is um, very clear here. Again, you ignored the rock who brought you forth. And this rock is the God who gave you birth. When Yahweh saw this, he rejected them, provoked to anger by his sons and daughters. He said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what will be their end, for they are a perverse generation, children of unfaithfulness. And here it is again. They provoked my jealousy by that which is not God. They have enraged me with their worthless idols. Now, listen, I want this to sink in. I want this to sink in big time. The whole passage about Deuteronomy 32, that whole passage is about Yahweh is the true God. He's the true rock. He is the rock of salvation. He's the true spiritual rock that saved Israel and that bore Israel. And the big problem Israel has had is provoking him to jealousy by turning to false gods. Now, that's the whole point of Deuteronomy 32. And Paul is a smart man. He knows how to interpret his Bible better than any of us. And he would understand this is Yahweh saying that Yahweh's the rock and that 
to turn to any other besides him is idolatry and will lead him to jealousy. And Paul applies all of that to Jesus Christ. That means Paul believes Christ is equal to the Father and that it's not idolatry to put Christ in the passage of Deuteronomy 32 as the spiritual rock, as the God of Israel, as the one who saved them, as the one who bore them, as the one who was saying, don't worship false idols, worship me. Paul puts Christ in that place. Yeah. This is so deeply Trinitarian, so masterfully explained by St. Paul, that the Unitarian has no response. I challenge any Unitarian right here, right now, to a debate on 1 Corinthians 10 and Deuteronomy 32. Just those two chapters, one Old Testament, one New Testament. I challenge you to debate me on either of those, or if you're unwilling to take on the challenge of a full-on debate, you can even choose the moderator and choose the channel it's on. Whatever. I don't think you have an answer, Unitarians, to 1 Corinthians 10 and Deuteronomy 32. I think it is just so absolutely, positively clear. Clear. And if you are here right now, put in the comments your interpretation of it, and I'll try my best to show how it fails. Because the only interpretation is that Christ is the spiritual rock. That's explicitly stated. And in Deuteronomy 32, Yahweh is the spiritual rock of salvation that bore Israel and saved them. Christ is the one um, who is provoked to jealousy when they went after false gods. He's the one they were testing. And in Deuteronomy 32, that's Yahweh. And there's a clear connection between the sacrifices that the Israelites uh, fell into that were to demons. We're told not to do that and to offer our pure sacrifices to Christ and participate in his body and blood. Positively clear. That is theological language, Josh. Positively clear. When something is positively clear, that is an elevation from most absolutely clear. Most absolutely clear is definitely a high bar, but you can get one notch higher, and that is positively clear. Yeah, it's true. Go look it up in your systematics. I think it was written by, you know, some old ancient guy. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's out there. <laughs> we like to have fun on Faith Unaltered. Come on. Um, so yeah, you really cannot deny that the deity of Christ is proclaimed in first Corinthians 10. Just can't deny it. All right. I told y'all this is a mixed bag. We're going to go to John eight. Now, now everyone says John eight, of course, John eight 58 before Abraham was, I am. Yep. That's a big part of it. Uh, that's a very big part of it, but there's actually a little tiny nugget that gets overlooked. Uh, and you're going to like it. I think you're going to like it. So let's look at John eight together and, uh, let's start for full context. Let's see. You know what, for, for full context, and there is another point I'm, I'm going to draw out of this. Let's start in verse 12, but where we're going to be really getting, uh, into the deep nugget here is when we get to verse 39. So we're going to read quite a little bit. But full context never hurts, right? In fact, it's helpful. Once again, Jesus spoke to the people and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus replied, even if I testify, testify about myself, my testimony is valid because I know where I came from and where I am going. Now, just right there, is a super amazing statement by Jesus. So the law of God says that to receive a testimony, there has to be two or three witnesses. And Jesus is saying, I'll, I'll get there to my second witness, but even if it was just me, that would be enough. Why? Because he is God. He's the truth. Everything he says is absolutely true. And once you come to realize that about him, you realize he's the only witness you need because he's God. It's a lot like uh, in the book of Hebrews where it talks about, I think it's in the book of Hebrews, where it talks about how God swore uh, to Abraham, uh, swore upon himself because there was nothing higher he could swear by, right? Jesus has nothing 
higher to swear by. You know, he, he, he is God. And so his testimony is valid. So right there, you have a, a beautiful evidence of the deity of Christ just right there. Um, I see people in the comments saying that John 8 is a defeater for modalism. Yes, it is. That's 100% true. That's not the direction I'm taking it tonight. But um, I did do a video on that with Andrew Elliott. It's in the Three Crowns playlist. You can find it. So uh, it keeps going here. Um, you judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true because I'm not alone. I'm with the father who sent me. And Jesus always talks like that, right? The father sent me. He sent me. Jesus didn't originate in Mary's womb. He was sent into Mary's womb. So he preexisted Mary's womb. He was sent here. Even in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies about myself and the father who sent me also testifies about me. So Jesus and the father are two different persons. It's it takes two persons testimony. Jesus is a person. The father is a person, but they are one in being. That's the defeater from modalism, by the way. Where is your father? They asked him. You do not know me or my father. Jesus answered. If you knew me, you would know my father as well. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the treasury. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Again, he said to them, I am going away and you will look for me, but you will die in your sins. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews began to ask, will he kill himself since he says where I am going, you cannot come. Then he told them, you are from below. I am from above. There again, he's not originating in Mary's womb. He's from above. He's from heaven. He comes down and enters into Mary's womb. You are of this world. I am not of this world. That is why I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but the one who sent me is truthful, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. We continue. As Jesus spoke these things, many believed in him. So he said to the Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, you are my true disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are Abraham's descendants, they answered. We have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say we will be set free? Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place within you. I speak of what I have seen in the presence of my father, um, in the presence of the father, and you do not, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they replied. If you were children of Abraham, Jesus said, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. You are doing the works of your father. All right, pause right there. Did you catch it? See, this is actually just as cool as, as verse 58, where he says the mic drop before Abraham was, I am. This is actually just as cool. Did you catch it? Do you see it? Let me read that again. If you were children of Abraham, said Jesus, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. You are doing the works of your father. In context, what's the thing that Jesus said Abraham never did? Look at it till it clicks. I, I want you to get there on your own. You're the children of if if you were the children of Abraham, Jesus said, you would do the works of Abraham. So you would do what Abraham did while Abraham was walking this earth. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth I heard from God, Abraham never did such a thing. What's the thing that Abraham never did? He didn't try to kill Jesus. They're trying to kill Jesus. Abraham never did such a thing. Abraham did not try to kill Jesus. That means that Abraham had to have had face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus where he could receive Jesus and cherish Jesus and not try to drive Jesus away. As the 
as many of these Jewish people were trying to do at this at this moment. Do you see it? Jesus says, you're trying to kill me. Abraham never tried to do that. That means Abraham and Jesus had a personal relationship all the way back in the book of Genesis. Genesis 15, the word of God appears to Abraham. The word of God appears to him. The word of God appears to him. Genesis 18, Yahweh shows up and Abraham feeds him. And then they walk together to Sodom and Gomorrah before Yahweh rains down fire and brimstone from Yahweh out of heaven onto Sodom and Gomorrah. Those two instances, at least, Abraham is with Jesus and he receives Jesus and he loves him. He does not try to kill him. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? I'm going to read that one more time. If you were children of Abraham, said Jesus, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you are trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. You're doing the works of your father. Abraham never tried to kill me. That's what you're trying to do. And he never tried to do that. Continuing on, we are not illegitimate children, they declared. Our only father is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I've come here from God. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you are unable to accept my message. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. So notice again, it's this murderer thing. Satan inspires people to murder, whereas the God of peace does not do that. Abraham was of the God of peace, so he did not try to murder Jesus. Which of you can prove me guilty of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears the words of God. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. They answered him, are we not right to say that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? I do not have a demon, Jesus replied, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Now we know you have a demon, declared the Jews. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say anyone who keeps your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died as did the prophets. Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered. If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. The one who glorifies me is my father, of whom you say he is our God. You do not know him, but I know him. If I said I did not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham. Truly, truly, I tell you, Jesus declared, before Abraham was born, I am. So before Abraham was born, Jesus already existed because he's the pre-existent eternal Christ. So there's beautiful proofs for Jesus's pre-existence in this passage, even before you get to verse 58, which is the real power punch of it. Before Abraham was, I am. But you know what? There's even more to, to look at in this. Did y'all pick up on the fact that there were actually three times that Jesus says, I am, in this passage? There's actually three times he says, I am, not just the one there in verse 58. That's the most famous one. But you'll notice that he says in verse 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And then you'll notice in verse 28, that when the sun has been lifted up, then you will know that I am he. Now, here's what's really cool. Check this out. Check this out. We go back to verse 58, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. That is, I am in the past, before Abraham, back way back then in the past, I am. Then you go to verse um, 24, and he says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That's present moment. Unless you believe right now, you'll die in your sins. You have to believe I am right now. And then in verse 28, you get the future. When, you know, when this happens in the future, when the son of man is lifted up, then you will know that I am he. So what you've got here is I am. Jesus is saying I am in the past. Jesus is saying I am in the present. And Jesus is saying I am in the future. That sounds a whole lot like the God who was and is and is to come. And if you go look at Revelation 1.8, you will notice that that is 
a name for the Lord God Almighty. And Jesus is essentially in different language, applying that same title to himself here in John 8, saying, I am in the past, I am in the present, I am in the future, because Yahweh is the God who was and is and is to come. He is the great I am, and Jesus is the great I am alongside him. Hallelujah. And amen. All right, mixed bag. We're going on to the next one. Let's go to Matthew 23. We're going to look at uh, verses 16 through 22. This one's kind of interesting. Check this out. So this is when Jesus is going scorched earth on the Pharisees and the temple elites. He's about to be crucified. This is during Holy Week. And he is just going absolute just fire on these guys. He is preaching woes against them. And he is really putting them in their place and trying to give them that wake up call that their soul so desperately needs. And so he says this in verses 16 through 22. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes it sacred? And you say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men. Which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes it sacred? So then he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by the one who dwells in it. Notice that he who swears by the temple swears by the one who dwells in it. So Jesus is actually saying something really, really powerful here. And I guess I should finish the the passage here in verse 22. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and the one who sits on it. Really hone in on verse 21 here. And he who swears by the temple swears. Uh, swears by it and, and, and by the one who dwells in it. So what Jesus is saying is when you swear by the temple, when you say, I, I swear by the temple that, you know, I, I did this or that today. I took out the trash today or whatever. You're, you're not just swearing by the temple because the temple represents in a very full and complete way, the one who dwells within it. So you cannot detach God, Yahweh, from the temple. He's the one who dwells in it. And so when you swear by the temple, you're swearing by God. When you say a statement about the temple, you're saying something about God. So long as his presence is dwelling in there, right? Okay. That's Jesus' own standard and words. That when you speak about the temple, you're speaking about the one who dwells within it. Those are Jesus' own reflections on this, right? Which makes what he said in Matthew 12... Super duper interesting. Look at what he says in Matthew 12. I hope you're picking up on this. This is when he's confronted about uh, his disciples eating on the Sabbath. He says this. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus replied, have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are innocent. But I tell you something greater than the temple is here. If only you had known the meaning of I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus says something greater than the temple is here. Now, when you speak of the temple, you're also speaking of God. Something greater than God is here. Who can talk like that? What kind of a mere creature could talk like that? That's blasphemy if it's a mere creature saying it. But Jesus isn't a mere creature. He is God. He can say something greater than the temple is here. The one who dwells within the temple is in your midst, in this body, in this temple of his own body. Something greater than the temple is here. Only God is greater than the temple. Jesus says in Matthew 23, when you talk about the temple, you're essentially talking about God himself. And then Jesus says about himself, he's greater than the temple. By his own standard, he must be God. By his own standard, he must be God. If It's it's one of two options 
and Unitarians, you're going to have to wrestle with this. It's one of two options. Either Jesus by his own standard is a blasphemer or Jesus by his own standard is God. Those are your only two options. Pick wisely. I put before you today life and death. Choose life. Of course, the option to take is that he is God. Do y'all see that? Please tell me you're seeing it. Please tell me that you see this. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 21, that when you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the one who dwells in it. Basically saying when you talk about the temple, you're talking about God. And Jesus also says that he is greater than the temple. So by his own standard, he's saying he is equal with God. By his own standard. Now you either believe him or you don't believe him. But don't act like Jesus didn't just say what he just said here. Something greater than the temple. By his own standard, that has to mean that he is divinity. That has to mean he is fully God. By his own standard. Unitarians, the ball's in your court. Are you going to call Jesus a blasphemer or are you going to bend the knee and call him God for the first time in your life? I pray with all my heart you will bend the knee and call him God for the first time. Pretty cool stuff, isn't it, y'all? I hope you're having fun. I'm having fun. Let me show you another one where Jesus, by his own standard, tells us he's God. So, One of the Unitarians' favorite verses actually buries their own position. It actually completely destroys their own position. And it's like uh, they sweep the rug out from under their own feet. Mark 10, 18, they'll quote this. The uh, rich young man has come up to Jesus and, and called him good teacher, right? That's in verse 17. You see it over here. He calls him good teacher over here. And Jesus responds in an interesting way. He says, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good or or uh, another translation, no one is good except God alone. Let's see how the King James, there is none good but one that is God. All right, this seems pretty straightforward. Uh, there's only one that's good, it's God. Pretty easy to interpret. I think a fourth grader could interpret that. So Jesus is saying, if you want to be called good, you, uh, in the absolute sense, then you have to be God. So that's the standard Jesus lays down. And Unitarians will say, look, look, Jesus is saying only God is good, and therefore he's saying he's not God. Pause, pause, pause. Are you saying Jesus isn't good? I'm pretty sure he's the good and righteous king. And uh, it is just pure scripture that he is good. Um, so, So let's go to John 10, where Jesus explicitly says this. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Remember Mark 10, Jesus says only God is good. Now in John 10, he's saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. So by Jesus' own standard, only God is good. Jesus says that he himself is good. That means he sees himself as divine very, very clearly. Yeah, you're exactly right. Jesus is affirming with the guy uh, and us that he is God. Exactly. Mark 10, 18 is an affirmation of Jesus's divinity, uh, not a rebuttal to it. And if that wasn't clear enough in Mark 10, you see right here in John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, what would any good Jew think of when they hear Jesus say, I am the good shepherd? Well, they would think of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, the good God, Yahweh Adonai, the God of Israel. He is my shepherd. That's the good shepherd. That's the good shepherd. And Jesus is that good shepherd. That good shepherd is Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh. All right. I want to I want to hit a few more just for fun. Um, I, I was only I, I was only planning to go about an hour tonight. So, uh, you know, I'm going to do I'm going to do at least one more. I might do two more of this mixed bag. I might even do three more if if the spirit hits me right. Yo, look at it. The Father is good. The Son is good. And the Holy Spirit is good. Hallelujah. Amen. Crown them. One, two, three crowns. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. All right. Here's where we're going to go next. We're going to go to Philippians. Philippians 1. All right. We're going to Philippians 1. And we're going to look at verse... Uh, 21 through um, 24 here. Paul writing, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. 
So what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. So Paul says right here, I want you to hang on to that in verse 23. I desire to depart and be with Christ. What is he saying? I want to go to heaven so that I can be with Christ. I want to go to heaven so that I can be in full face-to-face communion with Jesus Christ. Now, again, that would be blasphemy if Christ isn't God. Paul should desire the highest person in heaven. He should desire being with the highest person in heaven. This is also why we uh, have to be careful the way we talk sometimes at, at people's funerals, like, I can't wait to go be with my grandmama in heaven. It's not that that's exactly wrong. Like, I'm glad you'll see her too, but you should be much more excited about seeing Christ, right? That should be your your first priority. And, you know, after you stare at Christ's beautiful face for two billion years, then you can get to your grandma. You got all eternity to get to her. Um, You're going to want to just stare at the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. You're going to want to just stare at his gorgeous face uh, for... (laughs) for 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion, 5 billion, 6 billion years before you do anything else. So Paul is saying, I desire to depart and be with Christ in heaven. I want to, I want to die and, and go to heaven is what Paul is saying so that I can be with the Lord. And that shows you who he thinks is the crown jewel of heaven. He sees it as Christ, but look at Psalm 73 and verse 25. What does the psalmist say? The psalmist says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Okay, in context, who who's the you? I mean, you already know. It's pretty obvious, right? It's the Lord God. So, um, let's see. I'll just, I'll search for Lord here. Um you know, uh, yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and later receive me in glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth I desire no one besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is my strength, is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Um, Those far from you will surely perish. You destroy all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to draw near to God. I have made the Lord God, Adonai, Yahweh, my refuge, that I may proclaim all your works. So it's really clear that in the context of Psalm 73, this is speaking of Yahweh. Um, He is the prize of heaven. He is the joy of heaven. He is the one in heaven that we have um, as, as most precious. And the psalmist, you know, hyperbolically is saying, Whom have I in heaven but you? As if like, you're the only one in heaven that I desire. You're the only one in heaven that that even really counts ultimately because you're God. And so when Paul in Philippians says, I want to depart and be with Christ, again, this would be blasphemy in the eyes of the psalmist unless we were clear on the fact that Jesus Christ is Yahweh, that he is fully God, that he is the one the psalmist is actually talking to in, in verse 25 there. Whom have I in heaven but you, O Christ? pretty powerful. I think that's pretty powerful. Um, All right, let's do a fun one. Mixed bag, keeping it going. Isaiah 48. This is a really cool passage. Isaiah 48, we'll start in verse 12. Uh, So it's really clear who's talking. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, whom I have called. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. Boom. Simple. We're talking about Yahweh here. Surely my own hand founded the earth and my right hand spread out the heavens. All right. Clearly talking about the creator God. That's Yahweh. When I summon them, they stand up together. Come together, all of you, and listen. Which of the idols have foretold these things? The Lord's chosen ally will carry out his desire against Babylon and his arm will be against the Chaldeans. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I have brought him, and he will succeed in his mission. Come near to me and listen to this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it happened, I was there. And now the Lord God, that's Adonai Yahweh, has sent me accompanied by his spirit. 
whoa, that's really, really weird because it's all Yahweh talking, right? The whole time. I'm the first and the last, he says. I created the universe, he says. I'm about to redeem uh, my, my chosen out of Babylon, and you should listen to me, and I've got this mission that my uh, chosen one is, is going to accomplish. And then it says, and uh, now it says, um, from the beginning I have spoken and not in secret. So so whoever's talking has been there from the beginning, uh, from the time it had happened. And it's just really clear that God is talking, that Yahweh's talking. He's, he's boasting about being the first and the last and boasting about being creator. And then all of a sudden it switches to this, Yahweh sent me. Wait, so Yahweh sent Yahweh? And he sent me not just alone, but accompanied by his spirit. All three persons of the Trinity right here in Isaiah 48, 12 through 16. Clearly the God of Israel talking all the way up and then says, Yahweh sent me accompanied by his spirit. What's happening here? This passage is the voice of the Messiah. It's Jesus. This passage is, is Jesus speaking. And then it gets down here and he's saying, the father sent me and he sent me along with his spirit absolutely marvelously powerful. And then it should be no surprise that Jesus calls himself the first and the last in Revelation 1. Uh, let's go look at that. Revelation 1, Jesus calls himself the first and the last. It's clear it's Jesus talking. See, look, starting in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, but he placed his right hand on me. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead and behold, now I am alive forevermore. So this can't be talking about the father because the father never died. This is talking about the son, Jesus Christ. He was dead. Behold, now he's alive forever. And that is the one who is the first and the last. It's not a strange thing that Jesus calls himself the first and the last. He's been calling himself that from the beginning, even from Isaiah 48. And if you think it's a one-off thing where the Old Testament talks about Yahweh sending Yahweh to dwell, dwell among us, it's not. Zechariah 2 does this as well. Yahweh uh, will send Yahweh. Um, Zechariah 2, starting in verse 10, Shout for joy and be glad, O daughter Zion, for I am coming to dwell among you, declares Yahweh. So it's Yahweh coming to live among us. On that day, many nations will join themselves to the Lord, and they will become my people. I will dwell among you, and you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. Same thing in Isaiah 48. Yahweh will send Yahweh because there's more than one person who is the one God, Yahweh. Look at that in Zechariah 12. You'll know that Yahweh's in your midst because Yahweh sent me. You'll know that it's the Lord because the Lord of hosts sent me. Powerful stuff. Super awesome, powerful, glorious, rich, wonderful stuff. Don't you love it? The Bible is so so deeply Trinitarian. So that was just a mixed bag tonight. I actually had two more um, in my back pocket. And you know what? All right. Y'all twisted my arm. I'm going to do one more. We're going to do one more and then we're going to wrap up. I did tell my family that tonight would be a shorter episode. Um, but let's do just one more. Colossians 3. So in Colossians 3, uh, you have this, starting verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only to please them while they are watching, but with sincerity of heart and fear of the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with your whole being for the Lord and not for men, because you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Okay, so who's the Lord here? Clearly, it's Jesus Christ. In the context, it's Jesus who is the Lord. And so Paul is saying, hey, slaves, obey your earthly masters. Um, and know that as you do that, it's actually not them you're serving, it's Christ. So when you serve them with uh, respect and, and um, you know, that, and, and not, you know, not doing anything that, that would be out of line or whatever, um, you're actually serving Christ in, instead. It's Christ whom you serve. And then whoever does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. Um, so then, this is where it gets really interesting, you move over to verse 4, and Paul is going to warn the masters that they better treat their slaves fairly and rightly and, and definitely not abusively. And of course, remember, slavery back then is, is much different than what our modern brains go to. 
But look at what happens here. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you also have a master in heaven. So it's Jesus Christ, who's the Lord, that these masters are supposed to submit to as, as well as the slaves are supposed to submit to. The masters are supposed to know that they also have a master in heaven. Paul goes from calling Jesus Lord and Lord Christ to immediately calling him master in heaven. Now, there is only one master in heaven, and that is God. And that means that to be called master in heaven is, is just another way of being called Almighty God, being called the Most High God, being called El Shaddai, El Elyon. And so we know that the Father is Most High. We know that the Father is El Elyon. But here Paul is teaching us something new. Christ is also El Shaddai. He is also El Elyon. Jesus Christ is also our master in heaven, one with the Father. So mixed bag tonight. I hope that was fun and enjoyable. I certainly had a good time tonight. And um, there is one question here from Champion. If Jesus is God, how come he didn't know the hour of his return? All right. It's a great question, champion. Thank you for asking it. So I'm going to deal with this quickly because I do kind of want to wrap up. Um, I told, like I just said a moment ago, I told my family it'd be a shorter episode tonight. So in Philippians 2, we learn that Jesus is equal with God, but he does not consider equality with God something to be grasped, some translations exploited, and he empties himself taking on human flesh, taking on the form of a servant and obeying God unto death, even death on a cross. He does empty himself of some of his divine prerogatives. But here's the thing. You can only empty yourself of something that you previously have. And so one of the metaphors that I like to use is this. If I have perfect 2020 vision, but I willingly choose to put on a blindfold, I might say to you, I can't see. That doesn't mean that my eyes don't actually work. It just means that I have put a blindfold over myself. As soon as I take that blindfold off, I'm going to be able to see again. It's as if Jesus put a blindfold willingly over his full omniscience, but we know that Jesus is fully omniscient. We know that for a fact from other portions of scripture. For example, Colossians 2, 3, where it says, all wisdom and all knowledge is hidden in Christ. And Jesus saying, nobody knows the father, but the son. How can you know the Father fully unless you also are omniscient alongside him? Because to know an infinite mind, you would have to have an infinite mind, right? So we know from the scriptures also, 1 Corinthians 1 24, that Jesus is the wisdom and the power of God. He is the wisdom of God, which ties into the knowledge of God, because you can only be wise about things you know about, right? So Yes, during the humiliation, during the incarnation, um, and the uh, and specifically the earthly ministry, those you know years from Mary's womb to the empty tomb, uh, Jesus was in a state of humility, in a state of being emptied of certain divine prerogatives, but he willingly laid those aside and he has willingly picked those back up again. Here's the thing. If you were to ask Jesus now today, do you know the day and the time of your coming? He would say yes, because now all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him and he has picked back up all of his glory and exaltation, which he had humbly laid aside during the in incarnation, uh, specifically during the earthly ministry. Uh champion asked. So you're saying he, he can make himself weak. Yeah. I mean, he, he does make himself, um, a sacrifice. He comes as a lamb. He will return as a lion, right? He comes as a sacrifice. He returns as the high priest, you know? So another example, Jesus is the radiant splendor of God, right? We know that from Hebrews 1. He is the exact representation of God's nature. He is the radiant splendor and glory of God. And he is uh, the very glory of God, which Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6 in the temple. John 12 tells us Isaiah saw Jesus's glory, right? And his glory is so potent, so powerful that the seraphim they have to veil their eyes. They can hardly even look at it. Isaiah thinks he's going to die because of how, how powerful 
the radiant splendor of, of Christ is there. But he humbled himself of that when he took on human flesh and was dwelling here on earth. It says that uh, he he had no former majesty that we should even take notice of him. And Isaiah, is that 50 or 53? It's in either 50 or 53. But then we do get a glimpse of his radiant splendor when on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he shines white and glows uh, beautifully. And then we see that he has fully taken that back up in Revelation 1, where his eyes are like fire and his voice is like many waters and his feet are like bronze and his hair is like shiny wool. And so you see how he lays aside his glory when he's humbling himself and he picks it back up at the resurrection and the ascension. So, yeah, good question. And um, hopefully that answered it sufficiently. Y'all, I'm sure there's more questions in the comments. I am going to uh, uh, not have time to cover them tonight. If you have more questions or want to dialogue, email uh, faithunaltered at, at gmail.com. And uh, if you want to debate or discuss or come on the show or do anything with us, uh, get in touch with us. Also, we would be very grateful if you wanted to support the ministry financially. There's ways to do that in the description of the video. First and foremost, we're just happy you're here um, and, and listening to the content. Hopefully we're glorifying Jesus Christ through it. But if you did want to go that extra step and offer something financial, it's very appreciated. And we do uh, want to see this ministry, you know, grow and thrive. Uh, another great way you can help our ministry is by liking the videos uh, and sharing them to various social media platforms where you think they might be received well or, or helpful. So help us out if you if you want to. We love you. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. And we give God thanks for you spending time with us whenever we put up a video. I'm going to wrap it up here now. Um, and once again, thank you so much for being here. Receive this benediction. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, three we name thee. Though in essence only one undivided God we claim thee and adoring we bend the knee while we own the mystery. This has been another episode of Three Crowns brought to you by Faith Unaltered. I'm Dane Von Ace. I love you. God loves you. Until next time. Peace.